can we start by having you say and spell your name? Yes, I'm Nicole Pryor, N-I-C-O-L-E-P-R-E-Y-E-R. Wonderful. Today is August the 28th, and we are at Pryor, Bu Pryor Brewing Company in Greensboro, North Carolina, talking to Nicole Pryor for the Well-Crafted NC Project. So Nicole, can you start by just telling us a little bit about yourself, your, your background, where you're from, and, and what path led you here? Yeah, um, so I was born and raised in Greensboro. I never imagined that I'd be getting into the beer industry. I had so kind of intended to be an archeologist. I uh, got a history degree for my undergraduate. Um, started dating a guy who just really had a fancy for craft beer and said, I wanna open a craft brewery. And I thought, that's great, buddy. We'll see where this goes. And um, well, it went somewhere really cool. It, it kept going and we kind of kept working on it for about a decade. I finished up a master's, he finished up a degree in brewing and we thought, let's, let's do this. And so we got together with some other members of the family who were interested and we opened, opened a brewery here. Yeah. yeah. And so let's talk a little bit, we were talking before we started filming about um, your educational background yeah. and kind of how it ties into what you yeah. do here. Can you talk a little bit more yeah. about that? Um, so I knew getting into opening your own business that that can be really risky and looking at us planning out our family family and our future we knew that we kind of needed a backup plan as well so I completed a master's in public administration which is kind of like business school for bureaucrats um, so it teaches you a lot about how to run large organizations uh, management leadership um, accounting all of those different things that you need but it teaches you how to do that from a perspective of profit is not necessarily the first motive so um, that's my business school for bureaucrats joke and it's actually turned out to be a really handy degree not only because it means that I have a lot of job opportunities if you know I need to move on from the brewing industry but brewing is a really highly regulated industry we're regulated on a federal state and and local level um, it's industrial manufacturing but often in a downtown location so you're dealing with zoning you're dealing with taxes you're dealing with North Carolina ABC and so my degree helping me learn about how bureaucracy works and how to achieve things sort of within that framework has been really helpful to running our business too definitely um, well let's talk about kind of the decision to open yeah. the brewery you talked about um, your husband getting a brewing yeah. degree, but I would assume that it even backs up further than that. Where did you guys, where did the spark first yeah. come from? Um, I, the spark definitely started with him. Uh, he did some travel abroad and was really intrigued by the local beer scene in the Czech Republic. Mm. Uh, beer was really fresh. It was really different from what he was used to experiencing in the United States. The craft beer revolution was really just starting at second wave and um, I don't think that he had much experience with like a local craft brewery and so he came back to the US got really into local and craft beer in general and wanted to start learning how to make his own beer so he did he started home brewing and then figured that hey I'd love to open a brewery one day but even if I don't you know run my own place I'd really like to be in this industry so that's what led him to seek out a degree from the Siebel Institute and then um, just kind of from there evaluated whether or not it would be possible for us and we figured we would we would give it a good college try yeah um so you you talked a little bit about your previous degree and uh some of the the benefits that came from that but can you talk a little bit more about how you how you specifically see that degree in applying to opening the brewery you touched on yeah. it but let's talk a little yeah. bit more about so it opening a brewery is pretty grueling you have a lot of regulations on the manufacture of alcohol you have to get approved by the federal government you get your brewers notice from the um, TTB which is a federal agency that oversees um, alcohol production in the US and in order to get that you have to submit your plan, your floor plans, your location, your diagrams. Um, you have to have certain things locked up at all times. If your alcohol is ever stolen, you're considered guilty before innocent. You have to prove your innocence. If someone you know broke into our walk-in, we'd have to prove that it was a break-in. You're not innocent until proven guilty. Um, so you have to kind of jump through those federal loopholes, which require your space essentially being built and having plans for it already. And then you can get your ABC permit 
Um, so the North Carolina relies on the federal government having already approved you to make alcohol. Um, and then that ABC permit is required for a few local permits. So it's kind of like this really insane orchestrated dance of I have to have this done with construction first and then I can do this on a federal level, then I can come back and do this locally, then I can go back to the state and you're just constantly trying to figure out what's next on the path of trying to get open. Yeah. Um, and during that process of opening, and even you know since you have, are there particular resources that you guys have leaned on to help yeah. along the way? Um, other brewers in your state and in your city are really helpful because they know the specific state or city regulations. Um, and they know how those will kind of interact with the local level, uh, or sorry, with the federal level. So, you know, some places I imagine that you could go ahead and get your state permit before you maybe got your federal permit. I don't know. Some states are really relaxed on their alcohol laws. North Carolina is fairly highly regulated. Um, we also used the North Carolina Brewers Guild had some information out, and since we opened, they have just continued to expand what they offer. So I always recommend to people who are interested to kind of get to the North Carolina Brewers Guild, become um, a member, and they have a lot of information and can help you through that or can help you with an alcohol consultant. Um, we did not use one, but alcohol-specific attorneys um, and alcohol business consultants can really help you get through those loopholes. Um, I think it was easier for us because it was our job to open. We were not working also a full-time job at the same time. We had our part-time jobs um, and that was you know, kind of able to help us live um, and cover our expenses. But if I had a, a, a full-time nine to five, that would not have been possible for me to kind of figure out how to navigate on my own. So. Yeah, and let's talk a little bit more about the opening. When, when, when did kind of you first start the process of opening versus when were you actually yeah, able to open? God. I think it was the fall, summer, fall of 2014. The real estate search took about a year, so I'm not even including when that was not really formal. Um, but we started nailing down our location um, and started working with architects on coming up with the plans, which would allow us to start some of our permitting processes um, for the alcohol production. And then um, actually getting together with a contractor and starting to open was probably like early fall 2014. And then um, May 2015 is when we opened. Yeah. Um, were there any issues that you guys encountered, or we'll say challenges instead of issues, that you guys encountered in those early years? Um, you know, the Greensboro you're saying yeah that's pretty about how old it is yeah, <laughs> um, yeah, with the yeah. exception of natty's as a brew yeah, pub yeah um yes and no <laughs> it's a it's a really difficult process to open a brewery and i we have a lot of people that are like oh i'd, I'd love to open a brewery one day let, let me do this and you kind of meet two groups of people in, in that category you meet people who are like yeah you're you're definitely you've got this you've thought deeply about it you know how hard this might be and then the people who are just like yeah, I'm gonna open a brewery one day and I'm like that's great that's not really gonna happen um, because it's like running a marathon before you start your next marathon because when you open your doors it gets even harder and I think opening a brewery even though it's difficult is a good test of how well you're gonna do in the future it's it's not an easy type of business to run um, so so yeah but specifically locally we did not really have any problems with our zoning board um, with inspections with anything like that the city of Greensboro was was really nice to work with I think because they saw it as something that they wanted the city to allow to kind of have growth they knew that it was going to become a bigger thing here um, we're a great tournament town you have to offer things for people to do if, if you want tourists to come to your place and stay engaged in Greensboro if you want young people to stay here and try and find jobs here instead of leaving for Raleigh or Charlotte or other big cities you've got to have interesting nightlife for them and I, I think that they were they were really on board with that so. yeah and the space where you guys ended up yeah you know is kind of on the edge yes. of, of downtown can you yes. talk a little bit more about where where we are but also yeah. how you found the space yeah. and, and the process of going yeah. from getting it to where it is today yes. um, we looked all over um, we did not look in just downtown Greensboro, but we looked all over here in Greensboro. Um, we knew 
Um, myself, I was born and raised here. Um, all My husband and his two brothers were born and raised here. We're definitely a Greensboro family. So there's never any question that we would open somewhere else other than here. Um, but we did look all over and kind of weighed the pros and cons of opening up um, in a more industrial setting, kind of like maybe out by the airport. You're going to rely a lot heavier on wholesale to make your money. Um, opening up downtown, you're going to run much more of a tap room. And we thought that that was really intriguing. And we, we really liked the idea of having a really nice, inviting um, space that it was you know full and popular um, so we sort of through our real estate search narrowed being in the downtown area and we looked at a lot of properties and honestly it was just the one that fit our needs um, you know you're looking to open downtown but you can't use any old space you need high ceilings you need weight bearing floors uh, you need floors that can be renovated. Our, our brewery floor is covered in coatings that can handle like straight acid poured on them. Um, and you can't really do that. Not every owner of a space was interested in leasing to someone who needed significant renovations that are fairly specific. We have a lot of specific plumbing installed, specific drain types, uh, specific things on the roof that have penetrations through a flat roof. And if you move from being a brewery to someone else, then you know that all of that work that you did is lost and you have to pay to, to kind of have that fixed up for the next tenant. Um, so this space we thought hit a good mix of being downtown our landlord was really open to the idea of it being a brewery um, and it, it fit the bill as far as ceiling height we have a big warehouse out back um, it was we kind of knew when we got here that it was just going to be a perfect location for us so um, I can't say that being on the edge of downtown was really like a, a factor for us we would yeah. have been fine with this building in downtown downtown if it was there but it was more that this seemed great and we landed here yeah and this area I mean since you guys opened yeah this very specific this yeah. area has changed yeah. a lot and I, I think it will be um even more we you know we've heard rumblings of a few of the buildings around here maybe going up for sale or maybe going up for a lease for for a different tenant and i think that this is pretty primed to become the next kind of zone downtown if you think about south end is really coming to its own and it's an awesome place to be it's a great place to be at night it's a fun place and i think that that we're next for that so, yeah yeah um so Let's talk a little bit about, I guess, the Green, Greensboro beer scene as a whole. Having yeah. grown up here, I mean, you know, you've seen lots of yeah. changes. Yeah. But even since you guys have opened, it there's been a massive explosion yeah. all yeah. around. Can yeah. you talk a little bit about the changes that you've seen? Yeah, um, I think that people, it takes a while for them to think of a tap room as a place to go or a brewery as a thing to go see or a thing to go try and do and once that culture starts to take hold i think people are really into it um that scene is huge in raleigh and charlotte uh, it's huge in Asheville, and i think that we were sort of on the cusp of that starting in greensboro um gibbs had just opened about a year before us then we opened then i believe Joymongers, um then little brother then 11 11. um and we know of a few others that you know are kind of in planning i think some more seriously than others and i would say that we're probably due for at least a, another handful of new breweries um so it gets easier and harder as a brewery to see that scene grow it's great because um it's very much an industry where rising water floats all boats um, we will become more of a place where if someone's driving from Winston-Salem to go to the beach, they might stop in Greensboro and try a few of the different breweries, pick up a six pack, you know, take it to the beach with them. Um, people who come here for tournaments or conferences will know that that's just an additional thing that they can do and they can come and try a few of the breweries. So that's great. You, you need more than just a handful to have it be a thing that people do in your area. Um, but it does become more competition with your sort of regular Greensboro locals. They have more and more options and you really have to step up your game in terms of quality, thinking about what people are looking for, thinking about what kind of programming you might want to have in your tap room because you're not just making beer, you're making an experience for people and you've got really got to be on your a-game the more and more breweries that open so yeah and talking about community you guys do an awful lot of community yeah. events can yeah. you talk a little bit about both what you do but also the importance of doing it yeah um, I'll start with the importance we think that it's really important to engage the community not only because that makes really good business sense um, but because beer is sort of one of the ways that humanity started uh, coming back to my interest in archaeology archaeologists love to fight about whether people settle down to make fields of grain for bread or for beer and I think the answer is pretty obvious there that it was obviously for beer um, so there's this you know idea that humanity and that cities and civilization really started 
to make beer. Whether it was beer or bread, beers remain a really central part of a lot of different communities um, throughout time. And I think that tap rooms today really operate as what we like to think of as a third space. And I don't know if I'm getting that term quite right. Um, but they're a place that's not your home and it's not your office. It's a place where you can go and make new friends or hang out with new friends or old friends, but you're not having to clean your house. You're not having to have someone over who you might not be ready to take that step yet. It's a, it's a safe but familiar and comforting place where you can see and hang out with people and be in the public eye without feeling like you know, you're at a baseball game where there's just a ton of people around you. You're kind of in your home away from home. And that's really important to us. Um, people identify third spaces as um, stoops, front stoops, um, inexpensive coffee shops, uh, bars, things like that. And we really like to embrace that role here um, and, and think of our tap room as that. We do that through, um, we do a lot of charitable giving, and that's just kind of to engage our community and make it a better place. But here in the tap room specifically, we like to offer, um, we do live music frequently. We do a lot of different classes. Um, I like to offer art classes. I do terrariums on tap from time to time where we build a terrarium. Um, we do painting nights, things like that. But we also do um, a lot of giving back in our tap room. We have an event coming up at the end of September I'm really excited about with the Greensboro Symphony. They are going to start a series, a concert series here in our tap room. Mm -hmm. I'm really excited. We're going to move some of the furniture. They're going to have seats oh. set up. It's the real deal. Um, we're selling tickets to it. and. I'm really excited to work with the symphony. It's not only a really great night for us as a business, but um, the symphony gets to engage a younger clientele and let people realize that classical music is not just for old people or musicians. It's for everyone, and it's really interesting and engaging. So they get to engage a younger clientele that we kind of bring to the table, and they bring to the table the awesomeness that is music and that community, and they kind of bring new people on our doors, and we're just really excited about that and we love working with other community partners to create things like that yeah and honestly i will say i think one of my favorite events that you guys do is the bake-off yeah oh, I completely <laughs> about that. oh and i think it's become kind sure. of a go-to yeah. event can yeah. you talk a little bit about like where that idea yeah, came from and yeah, how it's grown. Yeah, um, the Great Prior Break Off, I can't believe I forgot that, is <laughs> one of my favorite things that we do. And that was the idea of um, our previous taproom manager, Jess, who was just awesome, a, a light in the darkness, <laughs> an amazing person and an amazing soul. And shortly before she left, she came up with this idea of, you know, hey, you really like the great British baking show. <laughs> People love to eat baked goods, especially when they've had a few beers. What if we did something like a contest and you know we then sold the baked goods, but all of that money went to a local charity and we started it with a Christmas cookie swap or a holiday cookie swap. We tried to be um, pretty secular here in the tap room and had bakers just knock our socks off. It was amazing the quality of things that people brought to the table. We were expecting, you know, just kind of your grandma's Christmas cookies and oh my gosh, people went above and beyond and they looked amazing and they taste amazing. And I get to sit there and judge. I get to eat like 30 cookies in a day um, and judge them. And we have um, professional judges come as well. Our last round was hand pies. And we had Brittany McGee of the Humble Bee Shop in Winston. It's an amazing bakery. We had Nikki miller Kaw, who is a local um, food blogger and food critic. And we had Lydia, oh, I'm afraid, her last name escapes me. Um, she was the previous pastry chef at LaRue. Um, so they came and offered really awesome feedback to the bakers. They all get to take their score sheets home and learn and do better next time. And then we sell the pies or the cookies or we have candy coming up in October to the public and they, they get to take those home and all of that money goes to a local charity. We've done urban ministries and we've done backpack beginnings. And yeah. um, it's just really awesome. It's a different crowd of people that come out. People love buying those things and feeling like they can give away those cookies to a friend or a neighbor. And um, yeah, it's just, it's become this really awesome thing. Yeah. And this may tie into what you were just talking about, but for you, how would you personally define the mission of Prior Brewing? That's really hard. <laughs> and we've talked a lot internally about how you have these ideas and you're opening this business and you've got these goals for it. But if you're really engaging your customers in the community, you're not entirely in charge of that goal. 
um, it becomes something where you get feedback and if you're if you're a shrewd community builder and if you're a shrewd business person you realize that you've also got to provide what the people want and we did a few really weird beers that we didn't think would be very popular but we really like that stuff because we get to try so many different craft beers and thought there's like 6,000 breweries in America like what can you do that's new or different and we we played around with a few of those with test badges and it was insane and people loved it and then we hit um our first october open we love halloween i love candy i mean i, I love eating i love candy um and uh our happy manager at the time said what if what if we did some candy infused beers and we did i made up um some rims for a sour patch beer so i mixed citric acid jello powder and coarse sugar um, and played around with that and made uh, when you it, it looks pastel but when you use lime juice on the glass room and then dip it into it it turns into this bright you know jello bright color and it just looks really appealing and it tastes like a sour patch kid and um, people went insane for it and that really made us realize that people are in the craft beer industry um, your consumers are looking for something new, especially in the tap room. You know, your wholesale to grocery stores is really different than, than what you're providing in the tap room, but I kind of oversee the tap room and enjoy that direction. And we realize that people want beer to be fun. They want to feel maybe a little reminded of their childhood, but adult at the same time. So you're having some candy and beer and that's awesome. Um, people like new things, they like to be impressed. And so we have just kind of run with that. And I think our mission now is just that beer, beer should be fun. There's no right way to beer. Um, we get a lot of feedback on some of these stranger things that we do too of people just really hating on it and I'll point to our tap list and go here here's half of our tap list which is just a plain you know basic crisp lager here's our amber ale here's our west coast style IPA with nothing in it why don't you try some of those but we've also got just a few things that are really unique and fun and um, we, we really like to have fun with it and our employees especially have started to run with that and come to us with just like the best ideas and yeah that's, that's really fun as a business we've got a like an internal chatter and um sometimes you know late at night people have had a few too many and they're just like what if we did this and sometimes it's a no and sometimes it's yeah definitely we're gonna do that so you were talking a minute ago about um some of the candy flavored mm -hmm. beers and i know you guys have done a ton of things with flavored rims and things like that yeah. for the glasses but one of the beers that I think really kind of stands out as unique is the Thai shrimp goza yeah. that was it last year or two years ago it was we released it commercially this year okay. and then the previous summer so summer of 2017 we uh, entered the first triad brewers alliance contest competition with that beer um, we were told to just enter a beer. It had to include cucumber. That was the mystery ingredient. And um, every brewer in the Triad Brewers Alliance kind of competed and entered a blind submission and they all had cucumber. And people were able to buy tickets to sample them all and then they voted. And uh, this raised money for the Triad Brewers Alliance. And I you know, have a really healthy or unhealthy sense of competition and <laughs> was really into that. And um, I really like our, our gozas and the variants that we make on them. They include sea salt in the beer. And I am really intrigued by the different fermented foods from around the world that are salt cured. And um, I cook a lot of Chinese food, like authentic from scratch Chinese food, and I use salted dried shrimp in that sometimes. And you chop it really fine, and it's a seasoning on things. It's not like you're eating a, a whole salted dried shrimp. And I said to Calder, what if we did that as the salt replacement in a beer? And he was not convinced um, for a few months. And then this contest came along, and I said, it would be really good with cucumber, salted dried shrimp. He was like, fine, just thinking it was a throwaway contest. So we made a test batch with the salted dried shrimp. And when we opened up our package and dumped it into the boil kettle, it you know kind of re reconstituted the shrimp. And we all were like, oh my God, what did we do? This is going to be terrible. This is, it smells awful. We're going to have to trash this and find something else to do. And we let it ferment anyway. You may, you may as well just see where it goes. Um, and we added some grapefruit to it. We pureed some grapefruit. Um, and it turned out really good. You get a really shrimpy, disgusting smell when you're boiling it. it. It is bad. It's really bad. No one wants to be in the brewery that day. But um, it ferments out to a really lightly sweet um, umami taste. So you get that meat umami sensation and flavor. Um, without adding tomato or beef or anything else to your beer. And I, I think that that's a really interesting 
um, new flavor that brewers are going to seek to develop. We've done another beer, a miso goza. So miso being another traditionally fermented food with salt um, that also added that umami. And it, it's amazing. Um, goza is a really great base to play around with because it's like kind of a a lightly tart version of a saltine cracker in beer form. So anything you can put on top of a saltine, you can really try in a goza. And um, yeah, so this year with the popularity of the Thai shrimp last year, it won, it won the inaugural contest for the Thai Brewers Alliance. We brought back a full production batch of it this summer. We canned it and we sold out really fast. Yeah. So yeah, um, we've definitely got some feedback on it that was not awesome. Most of those people did not even try the beer. Um, pretty much everyone who came into the tap room and said, shrimp beer, that's weird. Uh, when they tried it, they were like, wow, that is really good. Some people couldn't taste the shrimp. Um, some people pick it up at the end where you kind of get that light, sweet shrimpiness. Um, but yeah, that, that's been one of my favorite weird beers and weird beer stories. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let's talk about kind of your role here at the brewery yeah. for a bit. What and this this is probably going to be a really difficult question. Yeah, it is. Yeah. But what is a typical day or week, whichever is easier, like for you around the brewery? Um, it really depends. And that is one of the things that is hard for me. I'm a kind of a creature of routine, and I do really well with planning and habit. And so I'll come up with my to-do list for the day, and then I'll get here, and then something else will require my attention. Or one of my team members that I needed to kind of collaborate with to get something done wasn't ready that day. Or they spring something on me, and now I've suddenly got an extra hour's worth of work that I wasn't expecting. Um, but in a typical day, I wake up in the morning and right away check any of our sales numbers. I get reports sent to me about how the tap room did. I'm checking you know, our numbers, our product mix, what sold well that night, what didn't, um, why. You know, you know, our, our trivia night has a different product mix than I would expect on say a Saturday something like that um, so just checking in on that I check my emails for anything that's an emergency email that might need to be gotten to right away I wake up move on with my morning I have to get two kids out the door to preschool which is always really fun um, but it is nice in that I don't have to be somewhere right at 8. I don't have to be at court at 9 o'clock. I'm not an attorney. You know, I'm not a doctor that's got to be there for my appointment. So as long as I don't have a meeting, I um, can be a little more lax. I get to work. Sometimes I have meetings with um, either internal meetings or external meetings, filmings like this, uh, meeting with reporters, meeting with people who we're maybe setting up nonprofit events with, off-site concerts, things like that. Um, I don't really enjoy meetings, so I hope to not have many. I try and schedule them all on the same day. And uh, I answer emails, try and get to sort of a deeper triage of my inbox, and then I get to my to-do list, which might include coming down here to check the tap room and see how it's looking. I'm kind of the, you know, our bartenders do a massive amount of cleaning at night, and then I come in in the morning and kind of make sure, like a hospitality manager for a hotel might come in and say, you know, this needs to be straightened, this needs to be dusted, you know, let me refresh these flowers, little things like that. And then I really get on with my real meat of the day. Um, I do all of our legal compliance, so um, anything that we're working on within that realm, I might be working on that, that's usually email work. Um, I do our social media, so I'm often taking pictures, especially when the light is good or once the product is ready for releasing a can that day. And it's a new can release and we're canning it that day. I have to wait for a can to be ready and then go take a picture of it. Um, so taking pictures, editing pictures, planning out our social media schedule and getting those posts either up or scheduled to go up later in the day. Um, then just a lot of random things, which is where I really struggle, things that I didn't know I was going to have to be doing that day. Um, fixing a foosball table. Um, <laughs> finding out, hey, we think this beer might be infected, let's get a team down to the tap room and really do some formalized sampling of it. So, you know, someone tasted it last night and thought it was weird, let's go down there and figure out what's wrong with it. Um, yeah, just, it, it really depends. It, it, yeah. Yeah. Well, one of the things you mentioned just now um, was canning. Yeah. And I know, um, you know, you talk about the importance of the tap room, but you guys do a lot of distribution. Yeah, we do. Too. Can yeah. you talk a little bit about kind of the decision to do both and the, the way you've kind of grown that side of the business? Yeah. Um, we knew that we did not want to open a tap room only location. Um, so that would be a brewery that um, produces beer on a much smaller scale for consumption almost exclusively in your tap room. And we knew that we wanted to wholesale because we wanted to grow a business that would hopefully provide for our next generation. I have two kids. Um, my brother-in-law has two children as well, two daughters. and. Um, 
we have a long history, at least my husband's family, of family businesses. And on my side, too, my family has businesses. And we knew that we wanted to create something to pass down. And we just weren't sure if the taproom only model would really do that. Um, it's become a stronger and stronger model since we opened. Um, but that wasn't what we were interested in. We wanted to kind of spread at least over the state of North Carolina. So as we've grown, we've you know been trying to grow our wholesale markets. Um, we've really been growing them in Raleigh and Charlotte. Um, we've got a few things under our cap trying to grow it here in Greensboro. We actually just signed on with Caffey, which is a local distributor. Um, so we're really hoping to increase our reach in the Piedmont area, um, be much more available in grocery stores, um, much more available in bars and restaurants than we are now. Um, so it can be really difficult balancing those two though. We find in the tap room that people want really strange, unique beers. That's not going to sell in a grocery store. Harris Teeter does not want to pick up your Thai shrimp goza cans. Um, but that bottle shop in Raleigh does. Um, so we really have found over the years that maintaining your beer portfolio, the variety of beers that you offer, and the timing of those releases is incredibly important. And juggling having a busy tap room and also trying to have a great wholesale list can be really difficult sometimes. Um, and I'm looking forward to a few things we have in planning to kind of help ease some of that tension sometimes. So. Yeah, and you guys, do you do your own canning? You do your own canning here on site? Yes, we used a mobile canner for a long time. Tap Hopper Tours um, opened up a Tap Hopper canning. Mobile canning is incredibly popular, especially in North Carolina with the amount of breweries that we have. So that's where someone owns a very, very nice, professional, amazing level uh, canner. They can run anywhere from half a million to a million dollars. Um, and they go super fast, they come, they set up their equipment, they can your beer and they're done. Um, but we, with our model, that doesn't work really well for us. So when you're using a mobile canner, you've got to have a lot of beer all ready to go at once. And we like to do really weird beers and we like to do small amounts of those. And so that didn't really work well with mobile canning. Um, our mobile canners were great at what they did, but that didn't work with our kind of portfolio model. So we knew that we always wanted to have our own canning line um, to see those savings as far as canning, you know, more expensive to pay someone to come do it for you and uh, to have more control over our final product and also to be able to say you know we're gonna make this batch and we're only gonna can three barrels of it whereas when you're canning with a mobile canner you might be looking to can 10 20 30 barrels um, for a brewery of our scale of the same beer and uh, so that allowed us to do things like put Thai shrimp goza in a can yeah yeah well this is something that you've touched on a few times already but I think it's actually you know, it's a key piece of the prior story as a family business. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about the importance of the family to yeah. the business and vice versa? Yeah, um, that's a hard question for us to answer because I can't really think of it any other way. It's <laughs> not like we started as a family business but have since grown to where we have a ton of employees who are not family members or that we started as just a business and the family bought it and kind of took it over. It's just sort of one in the same. And I'd say it's the same for us having jobs here like it's just this is my life and it feels like my life I don't necessarily have a time when I clock in and I clock out I'm I'm always working and I'm always representing our business um, so that's a tough question to answer I think that one of the things that has been a real benefit to us as a family business is that you argue a lot which sounds silly um, <laughs> Sierra Nevada is a family owned and operated business and I think they've recently added to their marketing family owned and operated and argued over but the really wonderful thing that comes out of that is that conflict is not bad if it comes to a good resolution and if it's not about feelings. Um, if the conflict is about what beer to put in your portfolio next or what step to take as a business next, it can be really great to feel comfortable really, really advocating for your position and not wondering, am I going to get fired over this? Am I going to get judged over this? Um, are these people not going to talk to me in the future? It, it adds a layer of really being able to go to bat for your ideas without having to worry about the fallout of that relationship. Again, as long as it's not about feelings and fighting about that. If it's really just we're sticking to business and I've got this perspective on issue A and I've got you know an opposite perspective, as long as you can really keep it to, to the objective facts and argue about that, you can really go much deeper in, in exploring where you should move than I think a lot of businesses can, where the people don't know each other as well, where they're concerned about 
how people are going to, you know, how is this meeting going to end? How are, how are we going to all walk away from this meeting and come back together? But when you've got to eat Thanksgiving dinner together <laughs> the next week, there's, there's no choice but to really fight for what you think is right, but also keep it nice and, and realize that at the end of the day, that family is more important and that if your business fails or if something terrible happens there, you've got to value the people that you're with. I think that also helps us value our tavern employees. I think it's cliche for someone who runs or owns a business to say that your employees are like family. We really try and be very labor oriented and that we pay people you know, a living wage. Uh, they, we try and really treat our employees very well. I've worked a lot of minimum wage throwaway jobs and you can really feel like you're just kind of a throwaway employee. And I think that being a family business has helped us realize that that security that I feel in my job I don't want my employee to not feel that. I don't want them to feel like they can't come to me with an idea that maybe really upsets me um, or is just absolutely opposite of what I was thinking and not feel comfortable to voice that. And I think that's where we get these really crazy beer ideas at two o'clock in the morning or that's where we get a tap room manager who comes to us and says, you guys, you really need to change the beer portfolio in this direction. And, you know, that was a hard thing to hear, but then, you know, we end up moving in a, in a really good direction. It, it helps, I think, being a family business, it helps you realize that as a family, you need to value everyone's feelings and opinions and that that kind of needs to extend to your employees as well. So, yeah. Well, looking back to four years ago versus yeah. today. Yeah. Um, are there kind of thinking about your initial hopes and expectations yeah. when you first open, are there big surprises that stand out for you or things that you just really didn't yeah, expect it, or it anticipate? it feels like a lifetime ago. <laughs> um, when you're running a brewery on the model that we are, you run an industrial manufacturing plant, you run a business to consumer tap room, you run a business to business wholesale side, and then if you're self-distributing, you're also running a distribution and logistics company. So people like to think of craft beer as just this really fun thing to do or like beer is so fun and it's got to be, you know, oh, it seems hard, but they don't really think very deeply about it. And it's a really difficult type of business to run. Um, so that's what I mean when I say it feels like, oh, like our, our hopes and dreams to open a brewery feels like it's just difficult to even think about. I think in the same way that before someone has kids, they have this idea of what it's going to be like, and then you have children, and then it's just nothing. It's everything that you expected, and it's nothing that you expected. It's the most amazing thing, and also the hardest thing you've ever done, and it's really similar to that. I think opening a, a business that, any business, but especially one that's really difficult to run. Um, one of my hopes was to be available for my children, to have a job that let me also raise a family in the way that I wanted. Um, and this has let me do that. I am able to pick them up from school and then work from home or go work from home and my husband finishes up his day like we did last night. He came home and fed them dinner and got them to sleep while I came back to the tap room and worked a private event. And so it's hard. You know, you're working all the time. I'm never off work. But by the same token, I get to be at work more flexibly and more available to my kids. So that was probably my biggest hope and dream. And I would say that for the most part, I've, I've been able to recognize that and realize that. Yeah. Um, well, thinking forward, what are your kind of hopes and dreams for the future yeah. of Fire? Um, I would really like to see our business um, grow in our local wholesaling, which, you know, we're pretty well positioned to do that at this point. I'm really excited that we're moving forward with Kathy as a local distributor. Um, so I would like to be able to find my beer out of places. <laughs> Um, my husband and I don't get to eat out very often with two young kids. Uh, so when we do, it's kind of a production and, you know, we're working hard to get there right at 4.30 so that we're not disturbing other people. And, uh, you know, are the kids upset today? Are we going to be able to make it happen today? Okay, yeah, the stars have aligned. Let's go out to eat. And we get to Sticks and Stones and our beer just went off tap. We're always chasing our beer. It's a big joke. We can't find it at any restaurants. And we know that we're selling a ton to restaurants. And the ones that, you know, we're going to, it's just not there when we finally get there because um, craft beer in particular goes on and off. It used to be that you'd have a tap and it would always be that one beer and you know they 
put a new keg of that same beer on when that keg blew and nowadays people want something new and different and so it's always okay well beer a from brewery a went off tap now we've got beer b from brewery b and you know we're always like oh i see our beer was on tap at sticks and stones i finally get my kids there two days later and it's gone <laughs> um so i'm really excited i think to to hopefully be able to see my brand grow locally and some sponsorships and partnerships with um, local organizations, as well as just being like really, really available in our local area. Yeah. Well, and I guess the good side of that is folks are drinking it when it's out and about yeah. pretty quickly. They are. No, they are. <laughs> it's a great problem to have. We joke about it. It's it's an awesome thing. I'm glad to hear that that beer you know sold out in two days for them. You know, in the middle of a week. That's great. But um, yeah, I, I would really like to see us following a model of going very deep in our home market. Um, some breweries race to expand across the United States, some race to expand across the state, and they've got kind of um, you know, shallow distribution, but it's available in a lot of places. And that's awesome because you get people who are really into, say, that unique barrel-aged sour, and you can get that across the United States. You just have to know where to look in your different cities. Um, some breweries adopt the model of going very deep in their home markets, and so maybe you're not available in Virginia or South Carolina, but you're available everywhere in North Carolina or everywhere in the Piedmont Triad. And I think that that's definitely what we're looking to do wholesale, and I'm really excited to, to, see, to see that around here. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's shift gears a little bit. I okay. mean, one of the purposes of the research we've been doing this summer is talking with women brewery yeah. owners and yeah. brewers. Um, and one of the questions we ask is your experience being a woman in an industry yeah. that's a stereotypically, yes. although, you know, as we as we are learning and have learned, there are a lot more women in North no, Carolina beer than people notice. Now. Yeah, even, even with more and more women in the brewing industry, it's still very stereotypically male. Yeah, can you talk a little bit about that experience though? Yeah, um, I think my experience, one thing that I've learned is that women's experiences are all very different. Um, and I, I learned that by kind of getting to know some of the other women in beer and that it's easy to say like, oh, women in beer, and then to think that like a woman speaks for all other women in beer. And you know, I, I'm getting to know these other women who are maybe younger, they don't have kids, um, or women who maybe opened a brewery with family or a partner and they're past their career. They retired and decided to open this business. Um, and I'm kind of in the middle. I have a young family um, and that makes it really hard for me to get out to, you know, Pink Boots Society networking events that are at seven o'clock at night, the next town over. That's really difficult for me to achieve as, as a parent with two young kids. Um, so that would be the first thing is that all women's experiences are really different and it really depends a lot on what you're looking to get out of the industry and what you're looking, what you're able to put into the industry and that has a lot to do with your life, where you are in your life. Um, also, my experience being, I think, a female owner is maybe a little different than being maybe a female employee. Um, that female employee's experience as a brewer will be really different than a female like taproom employee. So, um, yeah, just they're all really different. And I think I can speak a little bit to what I've observed about other women and about myself. But that's the biggest takeaway for me is that it's all it's all different. And I can't say, hey, women in brewing experience this. So, right. And yeah. No. And we've definitely seen that. Yeah. You know, age yeah. makes a difference. Yeah. Position in life, position in yeah. the brewery. Yeah. Make and even yeah. the size of the brewery. Yeah. Makes and there's it a, a lot difference. of professional support for women in brewing. Um, and I've I've kind of run into this with a local organization for female brew works or female tap room employees or female wholesale sales representatives. But there's nothing out there for the female, um, you know, legal consultant or the female um, social media, you know, manager or the female just owner who does anything that needs to get done. You know, like it, you, I don't really have a job description because I have my areas of expertise and then whatever else needs to get done that doesn't fall to someone else. You know, I kind of pick up that slack and I guess you'd probably call me an operations officer, a COO at another company. Um, and uh, yeah, it, it, there's not a lot out there for women that fall into that role. And I don't think that there are many women that fall into the role of like a COO at other companies too. It's very much a scheduling, following up on operations, making sure that all of those gears are turning correctly and in the right order at the right time. Right. So if we had a woman who walked through the door right now yeah. and said, you know what I want to do? I want to open a brewery. Yeah. What advice would I'd you give run. her? I'd say run. Don't do it. <laughs> no. Um, we actually, we get that. Uh, we get uh, couples or groups of people that are interested in opening a brewery. And kind of circling back, I know I said it earlier, there's really two groups. And you can get there pretty quickly in, in sussing out how serious they are about it. And um, I usually start with where do you want to open? 
And if they have no idea, I kind of, you know, really politely just engage them in maybe beer and their love of beer. But if you don't know where you want to open a brewery, it's such a regulated industry that it really depends on the specifics of where you're going to open with what you're allowed to do. Some states really only allow you to adopt a wholesale model. Some states you could really go full in on the tap room and there's very little alcohol regulation. You know, opening a brewery in North Carolina is gonna be really different than opening one in New Orleans versus opening one in rural Louisiana. You know, so we usually start with that. And if someone has a pretty good idea of a location, um, I might talk to them. I'd also kind of, as a woman specifically, once I kind of got past the, okay, are you ready to talk nuts and bolts about this? Or do you just want to go, oh, I love craft beer? Um, talk about what kind of role they see and sort of assess like how, how do they see themselves fitting into craft beer. There are definitely women that work in the industry that are very into um, keeping the men in the industry really happy. And they'll say, I've never been sexually harassed working as a bartender behind the bar. And there's just no way that's true. There's no way that's true. Maybe you've not noticed it. Maybe it doesn't bother you. Um, and you can define for yourself as like, I've never felt harassed behind the bar. But there are a lot of women who extrapolate that to, well, I've never been bothered by this attention, so it's not a problem for women. And you kind of figure out where that woman falls on her understanding of what she might experience in the industry. Um, and from there, I might get a little maybe more explicit with them about some of the things that you might expect. Um, but overall, I think especially because I'm an owner um, and because it's a family business, I, I have not personally encountered on kind of an ownership level a lot of discrimination. I might have some times when I've said something three times and then my husband pipes up and says it and that idea is suddenly taken seriously. But I'm also in an environment where I can say, record scratch like I've been suggesting this for three months now and now that a man has said it it's an okay idea and everyone's kind of like oh I'm so sorry like let's let's move forward with that but overall I think our, our, our business feels like a really um, awesome bubble we have a number of female staff that work behind our bar one of our two brew assistants is female um, so I think as a business we're pretty oriented towards not putting up with any kind of crap for a woman in the beer industry it's when you move outside of that that you kind of know the places where you can speak freely about things that bother you like label design being really sexist beer names being really sexist um, which bottle shops in town care about that and which ones don't care and which ones actively kind of say screw you to the women that say hey this really kind of offends me um so yeah that yeah it's yeah. a long rambling answer but it's, it's a really weird and complex thing especially now that women are starting to get more and more into the industry so yeah and i think women are becoming more and more um a larger part of the audience yes too oh for like sure the drinking that, the audience. that is what i think started getting women into craft beer they had to like it and think of craft beer as something for them before they wanted to get into the industry itself you'll always have women here or there that kind of get into it just because they loved craft beer 30 years ago and that was a strange thing back then um society perceived it as strange it was not strange for a woman to like craft beer um but yeah i think it had to be a thing especially looking on our maybe brew side and tap room side um for someone to want to get into it as an industry that they really love they needed to like the beer in the first place um so we're really conscious of the fact that women make up a huge part of our consumer base um they make up a huge part of your wholesale consumer base because well, your bars and restaurants might be pretty evenly mixed when you're looking at grocery store sales. You know, it's usually the women of the house that are doing that grocery store shopping. I have personal feelings about how fair that is, but regardless, when you look at the data, they're the ones making that choice there, and they're the ones recognizing your brand as something that they enjoy. Um, they're the ones recognizing your brand as the one when they came to the bar and were breastfeeding their baby, they didn't get told to cover up. Or there was a changing table and it wasn't in the women's bathroom. It was just out. So dad could use it too. You know, just these little things that I think make a woman feel included here. Um, be it because she has kids and we make it a kid friendly environment or because we have female staff behind the bar that are not dressed and you know skimpy they're not there and dressed for male gaze 
they're there because they like beer and they like to talk to you about beer and if they want to dress in a skimpy tank top we say great that's fine you look great if they want to dress in like a four-piece suit like great that's great you look great like can you perform your job awesome i don't care what you look like and i think that having a variety of people as your public facing face is what helps women to feel really comfortable here yeah so thinking about kind of the north carolina brew scene at large yeah can you talk a little bit about maybe your I guess your favorite part, what, what do you enjoy about the North Carolina brew scene? I don't know. I think it's really hard to put something on that because I don't travel to a lot of other states and try their beer scene. But then when I'll hear things about it, it's like, oh, we've got, you know, 50 breweries. And it's just mind boggling to me because North Carolina has such a variety of breweries. You know, I've been talking about these different models that breweries can adopt to kind of survive in their market. And we have so many different models. We've got ones that have tap rooms, but they're in maybe a sleepy town. And so while that tap room is a really awesome visit, it's not a busy bar on Friday at, you know, 10 o'clock at night. Um, but they make these amazing, unique bottles that are gonna age for years on your shelf. And it's like a, it's a, you're holding like this little, gym of a bottle and then you know we've got breweries that you know exist in Raleigh and Charlotte that maybe don't put out a bottle that you're going to put on your shelf and open on a special occasion but man it's the coolest place to go and hang out and just have a few with a friend you know and I think that I like the variety that we have especially when I go visit another town um, here locally Raleigh I go to Raleigh a lot Charlotte sometimes um, Hillsboro Chapel Hill area it's it's really fun to see the different ways to make sausage in the same industry. Uh, yeah, so that, that's weird. It's weird being in a brewery and seeing how they do different things and kind of understanding some of the logic behind their choices of their tap list or the food that they offer or don't offer and, and things like that. So yeah. that variety is probably my favorite. Yeah. Um, so we have a few questions that we like to enter in the interview with yeah. that are always honestly the most challenging questions for people okay. to answer. So what is your favorite beer here at Pryor? Pick, you have to pick a baby. I saw this. I saw this on the list, and that's really hard for me to answer. It's going to be the same answer to the next question that I know, which is coming, which is your favorite North Carolina beer, which is <laughs> that for me, I'm not much of a, like a bulk drinker. I really dislike the sensation of being drunk and having two kids under four. Um, my tolerance is really low because I've had years at a time when I either couldn't drink or could really only mildly drink while nursing a child. And um, so my, you know, I really limited in what I can drink. And so for me, it's so event specific. So am I having that beer on the beach? I'm maybe gonna want probably our Mangoza, which is a mango, ginger, and lemongrass goza. It's really light, it's low in alcohol, it's got a little bit of salt in it, so it tastes really refreshing at the beach. Um, is it a Valentine's Day dinner? I'm gonna want that like high ABV, you know, Russian Imperial Stout. I think if I had to pick like a, a, an always go-to, also hard to beat some new seasonals. This is so hard, <laughs> so hard. I should have come, I should have known this answer ahead of time. <laughs> No, and honestly, this is yeah. this is one of the challenges that a lot of people yeah, have because, so hard. especially when you factor seasonals into the mix. Yeah, yeah. Well, when you're in the industry, you get to. It's not like it's it's one of the perks is that this beer is just kind of freely available to you, <laughs> and so you really get to get to be picky and choosy with what you pick. And so many of the people, I know someone's going to be a good fit for our tap room. When we ask them the same question, interviewing for tap room staff, and they go, "God, it just really depends on." where my headspace is and who I'm with and what event is happening. And that's when you know you found a winner. Um, probably though, if I had to pick one, it would be our Vladimir Russian Imperial Stout. I like it because it's good on its own. It's amazing. I can drink a half pour and feel a little tipsy, which is good for me. Um, and it's really fun to play with. When I come back to our fun rims and infusions, it's great infused with coffee. It's great infused with peanuts, with you know Reese's cup rimmed around the top. It, there's a million things you can do to it. And it's just beautiful on its own. And it's beautiful with a thousand other things. So that's, that's probably my favorite. Yeah. Yeah. It is a good one. They, our taproom staff knew I was having a really hard day. It was about a year ago when Calder put in our employees chatter that Nicole is taking a crowler of Vlad to the face. And that's 32 ounces. Um, they knew. They knew it was serious then. So. 
<laughs> oh goodness. Well, even more difficult is, yeah. you know, can you pick a favorite yeah. beer or even a favorite brewery? Yeah, other I, than I, prior. I can't. I can't pick a favorite beer or brewery. Um, I don't really drink enough to have yeah. like a go-to that I come back to, especially because being on a, a brewery owner's budget, people think that you just roll in the dough, and that is so not true. A lot of these breweries are um, big operations, and when you look at opening a business on the financial scale that most breweries are, you're looking at years before you know an owner operator is really pulling a salary at all or a salary of any kind of note. So my you know my beer budget is is really small, and it's usually my beer because that's free to me. Um, but I can pinpoint a really great experience that I had lately with beer. I was visiting a friend in Raleigh, and we had kind of gone brewery hopping, and we were at Trophy eating dinner, uh, that great pizza stopped by and I don't drink a ton of sours um, but I saw that they had a coffee and vanilla goza on the menu and I really like to try a beer that's gonna challenge me because I thought there's no way in hell that's gonna be good like no I'll drink a lot I'll put shrimp in a beer but come on a coffee goza and I tried it and it was so good that someone there clearly got a bee in their bonnet about this idea and was like you, you gotta let me try this and they did and they nailed it it was like i like paired with a beignet for breakfast oh my god it would be so good it was you got the bitter and acidity from the coffee so it really tasted like a cold brew like a, an alcoholic cold brew coffee and then just with the, the barest hint of vanilla at the end to round out that bitterness and kind of take it from being maybe a little too much to just wrapping it up in a bow and that that vanilla lingered on your palate with the coffee and it was it was so good i would i would definitely drink that again and again with some breakfast beer and i doubt that that'll be one that they offer very regularly because that's one of those fun things that someone who works there goes you know we're, we're going to try this really weird thing today and someone goes all right let's do it and uh yeah yeah. yeah, and oftentimes those work out pretty well. They do. Sometimes it's terrible, and you, you can't be afraid to dump it. Or just be honest with your consumers and say, hey, you know, we've got this one small keg that's releasing in the tap room, and we're not really pleased with it. Try it. It's cheap. Here's a sheet. Give us some feedback on what we could do better. And um, a lot of your core consumers in the craft market are really into that. They want to feel engaged, not just with the brand, but like with the beers, and they want to give you feedback and they want to feel like that feedback is heard and when you're honest about the fact that you're not perfect and you make mistakes and sometimes your beers get infected like just just come clean and be honest about it and people are really receptive to that so yeah and in some ways i think that feeds in with a lot of what we've heard about just the tap room in general which yeah. is it's a place for education it is yeah yeah it's a place for education and community engagement and part of that community engagement is we do beer come engage with beer beyond just drinking it learn more about it um learn about the ingredients that we use we use 100 north carolina malt or 100 percent north carolina malt like talk to us about why um talk to us about what you do or don't like about this beer don't just leave an untapped review you know to really chat with us about it and when someone offers us feedback in the tap room our our staff quickly let's call Reno or they can ask him a question and say you know why did you choose to pair these two hops together someone at the bar is asking me and he'll get back to them right away and say you know this is why and then that person gets that feedback just straight from the president and brewer so yeah yeah so the last question that I ask is one that I can't imagine you even have an answer to which okay. is what do you do? What are what are some of your hobbies and interests when you're not here at the yeah. brewery? No, I do. Um, I can answer that question because hobbies and other interests have always been really important to me. Um, and I'd rather be learning something or doing something than just kind of wasting my time. I love to knit. I have a knitting night that we do once a month here because I wanted to meet some other knitters that were maybe younger or younger at heart. Like I don't care what age you are. But I don't want you showing up and complaining about how your daughter-in-law didn't like this really outdated sweater that you knit for your new, you know, grandchild. Like I don't, I don't want to hear about that. So we have knitters of all ages that show up, but they're they're young at heart. Um, and I really enjoy knitting. I get to create things for my daughters. And unlike my job where I show up and I don't always know what I'm going to be doing that day, or I don't know that that beer is going to turn out. If you follow the instructions with knitting 
you will very incrementally make perfect progress. And I, I really like feeling like there's something that I'm in control of. I know exactly what I've done. I know exactly where I'm going. And you've just got to follow the rules. Am I the only one here that cares about the rules? Like sometimes that feels like, I feel like saying that here. And so I like knitting, I like baking for the same reason. I love to eat sugar, love sugar, love the Great Prior Bake Off. And um, I really enjoy baking, especially with my daughters now that they're a little bit older and can do that. Um, and I garden. We have a few chickens at home. I live pretty far out in the country, which I think really helps. It's a hard drive, especially if you have to come in late one night, you know, there's an emergency or something, or you know, some piece of equipment broke and Calder's got to drive in at 11 p.m. and come try and fix it all night. Um, but I really like living outside of the city and that kind of gives me a little bit of some breathing room for my job. The big garden, we grow a lot of produce. I can, I can a lot of our produce, put up salsa, tomato soup, um, stews, things like that for the yeah. winter. Sounds really strange, um, but it, I, you know, yeah, it comes back. I think to Calder, my husband and I, Calder and I, are very into m making things and seeing those results of your time. I don't think I could do a job where I sat at a desk all day and the only product I had to show for it was like numbers. I, I couldn't, I couldn't do that. And power to the people who can, but I've got to see or taste or smell a physical result of something that, that I've done. So knitting, baking, gardening, raising children. Yeah. yeah. And beer. Yeah, and beer. Yeah. And they all tie together. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, that's the last of my prepared questions. Is there anything we didn't touch on that no. you think would be important to the I whole story? I think that story? was a lot. Yeah. <laughs> that was great, though. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yay.